I am an, uh, a performance analyst, as uh, you said, and an instructional architect. So I'm an isd -er, instructional systems design. I define that uh, as different than an instructional designer who deals at kind of the course level, uh, whether that's micro learning or whatever traditional or not traditional means to convey instruction. But I spent the majority of my career doing what I call curriculum architecture design. And I did my first one back at Motorola back in 1981. And in 82, I joined a small consulting firm. And I've been a consultant since 1982. And I've done 76 of these curriculum architecture designs. And what, what that does is it takes a look at the entire job or process or function and everybody involved and goes after what are the performance requirements of those jobs. And what that means is, you know, what outputs do they produce? How can you tell a good one from a bad one? What tasks do they perform per output? Who does what? So you are looking for role clarity, role and responsibility clarity across, you know, maybe there's multiple people in a process or something. And then you, you do that to establish ideal performance. You do that by working with a group of master performers, maybe other subject matter experts, management perhaps, novice performers even. And what you're trying to do is get a really clear picture of what is ideal performance, not theoretical, but what master performers are actually able to do. And what you're trying to do is tease out from them, how do you do it? And then you ask them, so about the people that aren't master performers, you know, what are their gaps? What are, where are they missing the boat? And what are some of the barriers that they don't seem to be able to overcome? And what you're going to go after when you do instruction is, so not, not just the performance as if it's easy as one, two, three, or ABC, but what are the barriers in performance that people have to either avoid or if unavoidable, what do you do? And master performers have strategies and tactics on how to avoid things and what to do if it was unavoidable. So you get that clear picture of performance. And then I systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills because if you're going to build training or instruction or learning or whatever it's, you want to call it, um, you need to understand what the enabling knowledge and skills are. That in, so what you got to know to be able to do to perform. So once you get that really clear, then you can go into design. And I just, I've been developing what's now known as learning paths, but I've been calling them training and development paths since 1982. In fact, there's a training magazine article from September of 1984 that articulates all of this and how to do all of that analysis and design work using a group process, kind of a nominal group technique that I adapted back in 79 uh, with this group of master performers and the others. So you're really getting the voice of the master performers uh, to focus on performance, understand what truly are the enabling knowledge and skills. And then when you go into design with them, they make sure that there's no foo-foo, that basically you get the right content size, right, you get in the right sequence and you develop a training development path. And then we also build a planning guide and that allows, once you've performance-ized the training development path, you can personalize it by having people down-select from the path, resequence things, because not everybody's job assignment is exactly alike, even if they have the same job title. Everybody comes in with different knowledge and skills based on their education and experience. So you have to have a way to take a learning path or a training development path and get it down to what the organization needs that new person or incumbent to focus on from a learning perspective, and that learning is all performance-based. So that's a subset of this thing called human performance technology. Now, the name has been all over the map since I got in the business in 1979, uh, and it all kind of started with what was NSPI, now is ISPI, which is the International Society for Performance Improvement, and HPT, human performance technology, is all about the science the application of science, which is what the technology word means, to performance improvement, human performance. And as one of the gurus uh, from that uh, professional organization said a long time ago, is that all performance is a human endeavor. So there's been a big debate as to whether, you know, we need to get the H out, which was a joke, um, or leave it in. Do we call it performance improvement and performance technology or human performance technology? Well, ASDD came along in the 90s and kind of embraced that notion, but called it HPI, Human 
performance improvement. And that's why there's differences in the language and all that stuff. But to pretend that there, there's any consistent label that's used by any group it is, you know, misleading because it's not. It's all over the place. As Tiagi told me one time back in uh, 2008, he said, I don't know why we're calling it human performance technology. We used to call it performance improvement. And so, you know, so there's this long history of this mixing of all the language. But in essence, you know, if you thought of a process and the input-output process kind of a model, um, it's looking at that kind of at a, at a singular process level, and then you expand that to look beyond, you know, human performance. You're looking at the performance of the workers. You're looking at the, their performance within the context of the work itself, otherwise you know, known as processes. You're looking at the workplace, otherwise known as organizational performance. And you can look at, you know, societal level, what Roger Kaufman would call mega, which is basically social responsibility. How do we as an enterprise do things that are socially responsible, serve the customer, serve the shareholders, serve other stakeholders? Um, and so, you know, that's very complicated, but you got to take a systems view of that to look at that. So one of the things that I learned, I'm a performance-based, you know, training development kind of a person or instruction or, you know, many different labels again for this. But how do I make sure that I'm not trying to solve my client's issue with training when that's not really at the root cause? So there's many times when there's other variables in the process. It could be that there is no process, no consistent process, or that the data that people have to work with is insufficient or incorrect or late, that tools that they have are insufficient. So there's many other variables that we can be looking at, but sometimes it's not just knowledge and skills. It could be the human and their physical attributes. You know, do they have the physical attributes necessary to do the work? Yes or no is the answer. Um, are the psychologically, their attributes, are they psycholog psychologically, you know, a, a good fit for the job? Is there a lot of rejection and they have our type they can rejection in sales? process that takes 27 calls on average to make a sale. Well, people who don't take rejection very well won't survive very long in that kind of a job. So you got the old, you know, round peg in the square hole kind of thing. There's also their intellectual attributes. You know, do they need to be conceptual, but yet you've got concrete thinkers in there that can't be conceptual because, you know, or, or you need people who can do both. They got to be switch hitters, so to speak, in the, in the baseball sense. And their personal values. Sometimes people's personal values are not conducive to the job assignment and the work that they've got to do. And that's just the human variables. Now there's all the other, you know, environmental variables that, that you've got to understand that, take a look at what's really going on in the performance context. What are the requirements? You know, if you have new hires, yeah, what do they need to know and develop training for them? But if you're trying to solve a problem and that's why you're getting the call, then you know, my saying is uh, training requests for new hires should be expected. Training requests for problem solving should be suspected. So we need to go into that with an open mind in terms of, you know, what's really at the root of these symptoms that the client is seeing so that we can solve their problem and not throw training, expensive training, uh, at a problem when it's not going to really solve it. 